Thank you very much. I'm going to mess about with the microphone for 10 minutes because I can. Ah, stuff it. Well, it hates me. Um, yes, thank you very much. Thanks for that lovely intro. Thanks to the Philip Larkin Society for having me. And it's all going well. Can everyone, does anybody want to hear me? Um, <laughs> there we go. That's much louder. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, this, this talk is called Philip Larkin, the People's Poet. I'm going to work my way through a succession of glasses in tribute to Philip Larkin <laughs> during this talk. Um, let's begin. Morning, noon, and bloody night, seven sodding days a week, I slave at filthy work that might be done by any book-drunk freak. This goes on until I kick the bucket. Fuck it, fuck it, fuck it. <laughs> <coughs> fuck it. I'd like to apologize, not for that poem, a piece of doggerel which was in a letter from Philip Larkin to Monica Jones, but for the title of this talk, Philip Larkin, the People's Poet, it's a dreadful expression because people's, the people's princess, the people's friend, people's palace, while I was looking up examples of people's things, I came across the people's pension, <laughs> which is what, about £100 at the moment. It's, it's also not a label that I think Philip Larkin would have liked. He was friends with one definitely acknowledge people's poet John Betjeman, but of another, he once said, I gather poetry is now written by someone called Pam Ayres, <laughs> but one needs a TV to catch it. So what is a people's poet? Is it Simon Armitage, the poet laureate, or is it Kay Tempest writing dramatic stories of estate life? Is it Brian Bilston, the very popular semi-comic poet? Or is it a greetings card writer? I remember from the 1980s, there was a greetings card poet called Purple Ronnie, who supplied his own illustrations. And pretty much all his poems contained a rhyme for poo. <laughs> so there's that. <clears throat> but whatever, whatever a people's poet is, I put it to the world that Larkin is the very image of a British popular poet. And there are many reasons for this, which I will now begin to explore. And one of them is tied up with the concept of archetypes. People like archetypes. They like it when things fit a certain image. When you look at something and go, I know what I'm looking at there. People like familiar shapes and forms. And they like other people to take those forms. You may remember our recent Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, who very much fit an archetype for many voters. He was sort of a giant, exploding sofa, a uh, kind of large scarecrow who deliberately ruffled up his hair and quoted Greek and gave the impression of being a genial bluff cove that we all felt safe with. And you may also, on the interest of balance, remember Jeremy Corbyn, who also fit an archetype. He wore a little Breton cap. He had a nice beard. He had an allotment and grew marrows. He was a kind of geography teacher of the people. <laughs> and honestly, the, the popularity of those two politicians was very much bound up in the fact that they looked like recognizable archetypes. People like archetypes, and they like their poets to be archetypes. Dylan Thomas, pissed Welshman. <laughs> people like the fact that he was Celtic and dramatic. They like the fact that he had a wife who shouted at him. They like the fact that he drank a lot and dropped dead in New York. These are things that we want poets to do. Shelley, swimming the Bay of Naples. Larkin would be lucky to do a width at the local baths. <laughs> and would probably have drowned, so. Yeah, the archetypes of more recent poets. Pam Ayer, as we mentioned before, she's very much an archetypal doggerel poet. She has a Berkshire accent. She writes about teeth. She was on That's Life. She's clearly fun. <laughs> Betjeman, we mentioned him before, with his obsession with churches and architecture and his teddy bears. He's very much an archetypal kind of cuddly poet, disguising, of course, sharp teeth underneath. And Ted Hughes. I'm very fond of Ted Hughes, as, because I have an anecdote to tell. But Ted Hughes, a great poet, 
But with the leather jackets and the jeans, he was kind of like a biker who was obsessed with fish. <laughs> the reason I, Ted Hughes comes to mind is when I was at school in the sixth year, um, I was down in East Devon. Ted Hughes lived on Dartmoor, not literally, lived on Dartmoor at the time. And somehow we managed to get him to come to my school to read poems. And before he came, before he came in, the head of the sixth form said, now, Ted Hughes is a poet. So when he reads his poems, we want silence. When he finishes a poem, we don't want you to applaud or whistle or anything. Which meant that Ted Hughes came out, read a poem, and there was an entire room of teenagers just stared at him. <laughs> he read another poem, and everyone stared. This went on for about an hour. By the end, Ted Hughes was pretty much talking to his hand. <laughs> Pike. Pike. <laughs> It was a disaster. I never thought I'd feel sympathy for Ted Hughes, but I, <laughs> but I was there and I did. So, archetypes. Larkin very much fitted an archetype. And to give you a clue towards that archetype, I'm going to read something from a famous book. Eeyore, the old grey donkey, stood by the side of the stream and looked at himself in the water. Pathetic, he said. That's what it is. Pathetic. That was an extract from Eeyore Has a Birthday by A.A. <laughs> Milne. I thought that I would Google what Larkin had to say about birthdays, by the way. And he wrote, Birthdays are a time when one's stock takes, which means, I suppose, a good spineless mope. <laughs> there, I think we have it, a Venn diagram, I think, <laughs> separated at birth. And this is, this is the public image of Philip Larkin, this Eeyore-ish figure. It's a, it's a version of Larkin that Alan Bennett, another famous northern writer, co-opted when he read Larkin's poems for the BBC and also when he appeared, interestingly enough, in a radio play called Dear Kingsley, Dear Philip, in which Robert Hardy from It Shouldn't Happen to a Vet played Kingsley Amis and Alan Bennett played Larkin. And the reason I bring this up is a nice segue because there's an actor and a writer called Neville Smith wrote a brilliant detective film called, oh, I forgot the name, <laughs> Gumshoe, um, and was also, as an actor, interestingly, a kind of avatar for Alan Bennett. When Alan Bennett wrote a play that was clearly autobiographical, he hired Neville Smith to play an Alan Bennett-esque character. And the reason this is relevant is because Neville Smith was at this very university at the time when Philip Larkin was a librarian. And he wrote a letter to, I think, the TLS, who cares, the LRB, I don't know. Um, <laughs> he, he wrote a letter to this publication, whose name remains shrouded in mystery, <laughs> about his experiences with Philip Larkin. And one of those experiences was, took place on a rainy day outside this very university. Um, Smith had gone to get a bus, and Larkin was already at the bus stop. He said he was outside the university at the bus stop, waiting for the 24, Wright Smith. It began to rain stair rods. Larkin put up his umbrella. Seeking shelter and being much smaller, I edged towards him. <laughs> there were only the two of us there. He looked at me. I smiled and said, I did enjoy the North ship. <laughs> He stared down at me and said, if you think you're sharing my umbrella, you've got another think coming. <laughs> and with that, he pressed the catch on his umbrella so that it folded down close around his head. <laughs> I love that image of Larkin with a sort of cone around his head. And this proves to me that Larkin knew his own archetype. He knew who he was. He wore his popular image like a suit, and he wore his suit like a popular image. That's a clever image, isn't it? The whole Larkin thing, hull, being distant from the world, being distant from other people, the big glasses, being a librarian. Apart from lighthouse keeper, I can't think of another job which basically says, shut up and go away, <laughs> than a librarian. It is a fantastic way of keeping your distance and just disapproving. <laughs> Larkin was, as, as an archetype, he was as different to his old pal Kingsley Amis as possible. Amis was flamboyant and extrovert. Larkin was 
enclosed and introvert. He was kind of the anti-Kingsley Amis, but not entirely a quiet person. We've said, well, I've said that Larkin is a grumpy git in the old tradition. Eeyore, Victor Meldrew, Marvin the poetical android. And while Larkin wasn't actually a Yorkshireman, he was a seeming embodiment of an old Yorkshire saying, laughing's all right for them as likes laughing. <laughs> Larkin was very much about not liking things. In the 1960s, a whole wave of new poets came along, mostly from Liverpool, and they liked things. They liked modern poetry. They liked modern jazz. They liked modern art. Larkin famously said, this is my essential criticism of modernism, whether perpetrated by Parker, Pound, or Picasso. It helps us neither to enjoy nor endure. Of course, we know this isn't entirely true. Larkin liked lots of things, as we shall see. And also, he had other images of himself. He had, and his self-image, like most people's self-image, was different according to who he was talking to. True, in posterity, he does describe himself as one of those natural, sorry, old-type natural, fouled-up guys. But he was many things to many people. In his letters to Kingsley Amis, he's a blowhard, he's a stand-up comic, and increasingly reactionary. But in his letters to his mother and to Monica Jones, He's a sea lion. He described this sea lion, by the way, as a creature, and later it acquired a mob cap, like a Beatrix Potter character. But I can't really imagine him writing to Kingsley Amis and enclosing a drawing of a sea lion. Larkin may have said, deprivation is for me what daffodils were for Wordsworth. And he didn't need a host of daffodils. He could wander lonely as himself. <laughs> but we wouldn't be here today if Philip Larkin was just a miserable sod who didn't like things. He was a lot more than his archetype. He had a sense of humor, more of which later. He wasn't quite as opposed to the new as he made out. And as for the whole not liking new things bit, I would put it to you that his reactionary views were born out of excitement. You can't hate Charlie Parker unless you really love Sidney Bechet. Discuss. That said, back to Neville Smith again. Smith wrote in the same letter, when I asked if he'd like to read my series of articles in the Hull University Socialist Journey of the Left, he said, I shouldn't think so. <laughs> and as that last remark proves, beyond doubt, Larkin, despite the Dewar image, was a very funny man. And I admit that when we think of poetry and humor, we are often thinking of two entirely opposed things. Many great poems and poets are entirely humorless. The charge of the Light Brigade isn't funny at all. <laughs> Wordsworth rarely causes us to slap our thighs. William Blake's cartoons, I don't get them. Um, and Tennyson did not invite Maud to come into the garden so that he could turn the hose on her. <laughs> Philip Larkin was a naturally funny man. The letters to Kingsley Amis are masterpieces of sustained comedy. His record reviews are hilarious, and the brunette Coleman stories mentioned earlier are often criticized, but they're fantastic. His affection for girls' stories and the way that he subverts the medium, they're honestly really neglected and really funny. Larkin wasn't a comic writer in the way that Amos was, but he was a writer who used, com used humor to great effect. And of course, the poetry reflects this, which is one of the reasons he's a people's poet. Not that the poems are constantly laugh out loud. Very few of Larkin's poems have ended up on tea towels, this room accepted, obviously. <laughs> You're never going to see this be the verse on a Mother's Day card, sadly. So Larkin and humor. What is it about Larkin and humor? Well, Larkin once wrote in a review of the American poet Ogden Nash that Nash is in fact in line with those humorists who make you laugh at things, not because they are funny, but because laughing at them makes it easier to stand them. <laughs> Making things easier to stand is a constant theme in Larkin's work. Or is it? Larkin had a genius for what I like to call uninspirational quotes. One of my favorites is definitely being brave, lets no one off the grave. Put that on a t-shirt <laughs> and stay fashionable. Larkin also obviously likes to make us laugh because he is, it is funny. 
Take, for example, I Remember, I Remember, in which Larkin, as you know, details an entire inventory of ways in which his childhood was unspent. It's an increasingly absurd list of things that didn't happen in an ungilded youth. I'm doing a Larkin now. I'm saying un at the start of every adjective. It's a really good way to fill up time. In this poem, Larkin writes, My doggerel was not set up in blunt ten-point, nor read by a distinguished cousin of the mayor. And it begins famously and brilliantly, Our garden first where I did not invent blinding theologies of flowers and fruits and wasn't spoken to by an old hat. It's one of my all-time favourite lines. I always wonder which author actually did claim to have been spoken to by an old hat. Incidentally, you can see the first part of this poem on a plaque at Coventry Railway Station, credited to Philip Larkin, poet and Coventrian, but oddly they've missed out the final section. You look as though you wished the place in hell, my friend said, judging from your face. Oh, well, I suppose it's not the place's fault, I said. Nothing like something happens anywhere. Come to Coventry. <laughs> there are things that Larkin, as a poet, isn't. He's very rarely sentimental. You may recall Born Yesterday, the poem dedicated to Kingsley Amos's daughter, S Sally, with its blessing, May You Be Ordinary. Larkin isn't reassuring. We all know what will survive of us is love, but we also know that it's an almost truth. And he's not really a traditionalist. Yes, Larkin's poems rhyme and they have conventional meter, but very few of them would sit nicely in Palgrave's golden treasury of English verse. There are no these and thous. There are very few classical references, but what there is instead is a simplicity of language that's sometimes droll, as in water. If I were called in to construct a religion, I should make use of water. His language is often simple. Days. What are days for? Days are where we live. And funny. Oh, I mean, it's almost always funny. Let's hear it for hatless. I take off my cycle clips in awkward reverence. That's a T-shirt. <laughs> Sometimes, of course, Larkin is shocking. This be the verse in its famous opening line and high windows. When I see a couple of kids and guess he's fucking her and she's taking pills or wearing a diaphragm. And sometimes, in fact frequently, it's sublime. I don't know a more beautiful evening poem than At Grass, where the horses have slipped their names and stand at ease, or gallop for, must, for what must be joy. Larkin writes in a plain English that's not plain at all. And for me, this is the heart of things with Larkin. He's a poet of the ordinary, who uses ordinary language and writes about ordinary things, but he takes all that and he makes it into something transcendent. High windows may begin with fucking and diagrams, but it ends with the thought of high windows, the sun comprehending glass, and beyond it, the deep blue air that shows nothing and is nowhere and is endless. As a poet, Philip Larkin was the extraordinary disguised as the ordinary, transcendence out of the mundane. Sometimes he'd reverse that trend. He'd take the existential despair of Obard, which is swelling into a near rage, and then ending the poem on that note of mundane, almost optimism. The telephones crouching, getting ready to ring in locked up offices, and the postmen, like doctors, who go from house to house. Larkin was a brilliant poet who lived in our ordinary world. We could definitely do with someone like him now, but I'm wondering what he would make of today's popular culture. I mean, I'm not wondering that hard. He'd probably hate it, <laughs> if we're honest. And I can't see him on Big Brother. <laughs> Having a chat on the sofa with Cardi B and Lulu. <laughs> but I can see him on Gogglebox with Monica Jones. <laughs> Having a large whiskey and disapproving of things. <laughs> or maybe he'd be on with Kingsley Amis. That would be amazing. The, real life Statler and Waldorf. <laughs> I think he'd probably have enjoyed, or would enjoy, my tenses are all over there, I think he'd probably enjoy the repair shop. I think the idea of people bringing in ordinary broken objects that they loved to have them made beautiful again and is an incredibly Larkin-esque concept. Because Philip Larkin was a man who felt things. Everything he wrote was inspired by deep feeling and that, I think, in conclusion, almost, is what makes him the people's poet. 
I'm going to end now with a poem that contains almost everything I like about Philip Larkin. The mower. The mower stalled twice. Kneeling, I found a hedgehog jammed up against the blades, killed. It had been in the long grass. I had seen it before and even fed it once. Now I had mauled its unobtrusive world unmendably. Burial was no help. Next morning I got up and it did not. The first day after a death, the new absence is always the same. We should be careful of each other. We should be kind while there is still time. Thank you.